In this problem we're looking for currents I1 and I2. We're looking for their time domain equations or time domain responses. And we're supposed to do this using S domain analysis. So we've got a capacitor in there. That means we need to find the initial conditions on that. So that means we need to go ahead and make an assignment for our capacitor voltage. So let me first set up the circuit for T less than zero so we can find the initial condition on that capacitor. The switch here is open before T equals zero. So let me replace that by an open. So we see that we've got zero current for I2 when T is less than zero. That will be important later on when we're trying to come up with our full solution. Uh, zero current through the AK resistor means we've got zero volts there. And again, with this disconnect right there, we essentially can ignore everything to the right of that line. The capacitor looks like an open circuit, so let me replace that by an open. Now, with this open, we have no place for current to go through the 15K resistor, so I1 of T is also zero for T less than zero. Again, that will be the other half of our solution for I1. Zero current there means zero voltage drop across the 15K resistor. So the 15, I'm sorry, 5 volt value appears there. So VC of 0 is 5 volts. That's what we need then to move this circuit into the S domain. So to do that, let me pull up the original circuit. So now we're saying, let's draw the circuit for T greater than or equal to zero, and we want to do that as an S domain circuit. So when we look at our capacitor right there, we have the option of the series voltage source, or we have the option of the capacitor in parallel with the current source. So the specific choice of those two is really motivated by what makes it easiest for you to do your analysis later on. Um, we're trying to find essentially a mesh current, because that's the same thing as I1. I2 is also a mesh current, because again, after t equals zero, this looks like a short circuit. So if we're doing mesh analysis, it would probably be nicer not to introduce more meshes. So let's go ahead and use that form for the capacitor. So let me make the modifications to the circuit based on that previous discussion. Constant voltage source ends up looking like the voltage source value divided by S. Based on the 10 microfarad value, this value ends up looking like 100,000 divided by S. And I'll plug in 5 volts for our initial voltage. And that completes the conversion of the circuit into the S domain. At this point, we then proceed to a standard mesh analysis. So I'll start with mesh 1, start in the lower left corner. So we have minus 5 over S plus 15 k times I1 of S plus the capacitor impedance, which is 100 times 10 to the third divided by S. Then we've got mesh current 1 heading this way, and then we've got I2 heading in the other direction, so we subtract that. Let's try that again. I2 of S. And then we have a voltage source 
bump into the positive sign first. So that's 5 over s. Set that equal to 0. In mesh number 2, again I'll start in the lower left corner down here, we have minus 5 over s plus 8k times i2 of s. And we don't want to forget the capacitor impedance, 100 times 10 to the third divided by s. So now we have I2 heading up from the bottom. I1 is going in the other direction. And we set that equal to 0. So let's take this pair of equations and place that into Maple for solution. And I'll briefly walk you through my worksheet here. Again, standard stuff here where I'm restarting and uh, specifying that I want to do S or Laplace domain type stuff, so I need Laplace and inf, inf Laplace. Um, I'm setting up my equations just like we had written them. Here I'm saying let's create a variable called solution and equate that to solve the equations for I1 and I2. That gives me some results. Uh, I want to operate on this a little bit first before looking at it. Um, take the solution and let's do a partial fraction expansion on that. And this is helpful to try to identify the individual um, terms. Typically you find things like uh, first order terms, second order terms, and so on. And you like, to appear, like them to appear as a sum of those basic terms. And then we'll go ahead and do the inverse Laplace transform on that result. And then I1 for t greater than 0 looks like that piece. So let me write that down in more of a, a standard form on the other side. So I'm only carrying three significant digits in my answer. I'm also writing it in standard engineering prefix notation, so those currents are in terms of microamps. I've also converted that term to the reciprocal of the 19, minus 19.166 so and so on. So that way this is the time constant and uh, here we see that that's basically says the time constant is on the order of 52 milliseconds. So that tells us the behavior after t equals 0. Recall again that we had said that the current was 0 prior to t equals 0. I just noticed something that needs to be removed and actually inserted another negative sign that wasn't required. So coming to I2, and again writing it in uh, more of a standard notation, we have the expression on top and 0 for t less than 0. Let's just do a quick sketch to try to get a feel for what these equations are saying. If I plot I1, we start out at 0 and Right at t equals 0, looking at that piece there, we'd have e to the 0, so that's 1, 217 minus 217 is 0, so we start at 0. As t approaches infinity, this whole piece drops out, and so we end up at 217 microamps. I2 of t also started out at 0. Now in this case, as we look right here, when t equals 0, we've got e to the 0 is 1, so we have 217 plus 408, which is 625 microamps. So these two graphs, of course, aren't to scale at this point. 
so 625 microamps. So we have a step discontinuity in the current, which again is, is possible. The only time you'd expect a current to always be continuous is if it was an inductor current. Um, so plugging in T equals infinity, that essentially says E to the minus infinity is zero. This whole term goes to zero, and so that says this all drops off to 217 microamps. So I'm going to take these graphs and let's place those back on the original circuit and see if we can make sure we've got good physical understanding of what's happening. Let's jump to this interesting behavior where they both ended up at 217 microamps in the end. So in the final DC steady state where this is a short circuit and this goes back to an open, then I1 is the same thing as I2. So we just have one current circulating like that. Let's look back at the beginning uh, right when this switch closed. Here we see that we've got continuity in the current I1. That kind of makes sense because we had a voltage source on one side. And we effectively have something that controls the voltage between its nodes on the other side. The capacitor voltage is continuous so that part makes sense down here. Um, finally, the discontinuous part here, as we discussed earlier, this current started, or I2 started as zero. As soon as we plug that capacitor voltage across it, then uh, we see this abrupt increase in the voltage, and then we have the decay as the capacitor tends to